Hello and welcome everybody, I'm OneProud Bavarian and we are back here with another episode of Beta Testing Terminal Conflict. Let me just begin this episode by saying that this will be a heavy hitter. This episode comes with Scenario 7 and Scenario 7 is way different than everything that we've seen before. If you're just interested in the basics, if you want to learn what this game is all about and get an easy story introduction, then go to the earlier videos that I've produced on this channel because this one will be a practically regional free-to-play scenario. It will blow your mind <laughs> as to how complex that is. And uh, I will play in a fairly peaceful playstyle. There are other playstyles, but I think in the current build, the peaceful, uh, peaceful playstyle is the best choice. And I'm going to go with that simply because I can actually show you a victory. Don't ask me how often I have lost this scenario, all right? It's, it's not easy. It is very, very hard indeed. And the password may or may not still be schnitzel, and here we are, it's gonna be about the big picture. So, access granted, error 404, cached files restored, an arrow, backup record batch, number 4601C. Two tigers, two tigers, running fast, running fast. One will stumble, the other will rise as a mighty dragon. Now that, of course, refers to Chiang Kai-shek and Ma Zedong. Now, as you can see, we are orange, and that puts us on the Soviet camp. We are supporting Mao Zedong, and we hope that we can help him rise to power. As communism illuminates the East with our great unifying message, a shadow is ravenous to devour it. Capitalism. Help our brothers to sweep the vile invaders out of the way by securing control of East Asia. Right. Okay, thanks, Mervin. As you can see in this scenario, we must achieve two things. The first one is secure 50% control of East Asia. And the second one is Mao Zedong's power greater than zero. So he's a leader and he cannot fall out of power or we will lose the scenario. Uh, if we disconnect or if we mismanage our domestic interests, we will also lose. And the domestic interests, I can tell you, this game, uh, you can't rush through turns in this game. That is all I can tell you, okay? It's going to get easier in this scenario the longer we go, simply because there is a little tweak to this scenario that makes it so that you understand one of the very important mechanics, uh, if you are successful at it, that is. But I, I assume, and I've already talked to the developers, this will change a tiny bit in the final build. It's just here to showcase something. And the scenario itself will probably change a lot, because that is just the, the nature of a beta build. But first and foremost, let's take a look at the world map here. As you can see, obviously, the Eastern European bloc and then all of Russia and Mongolia are under our control. China's a war zone. Uh, so is Vietnam. So is down here the Gulf of Aden and uh, the Middle East. It's not really a war zone. Like, a war zone doesn't mean that constantly everybody's fighting, but it means that enemy contact is to be expected. Uh, down here, obviously, the proper... Uh, uh, area of the USA. They haven't taken Western Europe yet, but you know, that is something that they will certainly do. I know, for example, that also in this scenario, I think the AI is not necessarily trimmed to exclusively be active in East Asia. Well, we are trimmed to that. Uh, I've seen them try some coups in in Iran. <laughs> so we're going to see a lot of interesting things here. And I'm just going to press done. Right, here you go, you, you know, we're gonna take a look at this for, for often enough, okay, don't worry about it. So, before you start a game, you will, you have these different timelines. The first timeline is always 1946 to 1950, the second is 1951 to 1940, 1955, and so on and so forth. Every uh, timeline ends after both sides, and that is the important part, both sides, us and them, run out of FP, focus points. You gain focus points via different decisions, for example, in events, you're going to see that in abundance in, in this playthrough here. And you lose them if you, for example, move in a troop, or if you secure a territory, or if you do a special choice, etc, etc, okay? In this theater, we have deployed the armed forces of uh, the tanks and the submarines, and we can now choose our interest focus. Should we focus on gaining elites, so building up elites in our country, or should we focus on strengthening the military? I choose elites simply because I personally believe that, uh, believe that it is much easier to win the scenario with elites. Anyway, subject, theater status report. We are in an arms race mode, so this theater is not gearing down. There is no... Uh, garrisoning troops etc going on this one is deploying and maybe full on war this could trigger 
uh, uh, nuclear war. Rising local tension enables mandate for regional war zone declarations, cross theater land and sea maneuvers from adjacent regions on standby. So it is po uh, stand by standby. So it is possible and you will oh, see that race. in a second. The Red Dragon Rising. In the flames of civil war, Chinese commanders battle to capture non-controlled regions. Ma Zedong is in hiding, hoping to increase his power. Assassins are lurking around every corner and only sufficient power will keep him alive. In his place, he has sent forth his ally Kim Il-sung and three liaisons officers to take up contact with Soviet High Command. One of them is an officer with a simple background but extraordinary talent. East Asia policy updated. Right, and here's the first thing uh, that needs some explaining. This is an event, every turn that you begin can theoretically have an event pop up. This one is a calamish, uh, calamitous, camel, camel, calamitous, calamitous request <laughs> from Vyacheslav Molotov, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our covertly supported group of local tribal leaders are now openly suggesting that he, uh, that we assume mediation between the between them and the Chinese authorities for their independence, calling themselves representatives of the revolution in, in Urumqi. So, now we have three things, but only one is currently selectable. Make no selection, recognize the East Turkestan Republic, and shift to post-war development. If we were to do nothing at all, okay, for the entire game here, but station one unit, be it land or air, in Urumqi, and the timeline ends, then this would be the case. Right now, we can only click this one, send summons, then condolence for their plane crash, plus one people, down here, minus one elites, minus one influence of communism in Urimki, that's something we definitely don't want, and plus two power to Mao Zedong. Or, recognize communist Chinese claims, minus one government, plus two power to Mao Zedong. So, that is something we can only pick if we have Mao Zedong risen to power, which we currently haven't, and which we won't do for a few turns for the foreseeable future. But we, if, if we have an event that essentially says make no selection, it will stay in the background until the timeline ends. So if you have, you know, you got to keep it in mind, as long as the timeline isn't over, you can always pick this as long as Mao Zedong rises to power at some, any point. So we're just going to click, click X and here we are. Holy shit, there's a lot to explain here today, isn't there? Um, as you can see, we have some troops already here in Eastern Manchuria. We have some troops in Mongolia, which is a friendly state, so it's already fully under control. Um, all of this, everything that is striped, is a war zone, so both we and both them can put in troops into these regions, which essentially would be understood to be, you know, uh... How do you, how do you call it? Oh god, I forgot about it. What do you call those conflicts in the Cold War? <clears throat> Where the two sides don't directly face each other, but they just send material in? Oh god damn it. Uh, you know what I'm saying, right? Proxy war, oh, <laughs> Man, my brain is melting in this heat. So this is essentially a proxy war. We can send in troops and so on and so forth. And as you can see here, North Korea and South Korea are currently not fully controlled by either side, but they are also not declared war zones. They are in a state of just being controlled because after World War II, uh, the US took this over, we took this over, and then they took also over South Korea, but it isn't fully yet into our sphere, right? What I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna establish, so as soon as you reach three here, uh, you have this province under your control and I'm gonna establish control here in Shenyang in Eastern Manchuria With this tank unit this button establishes control this button puts it on a boat if we have a boat and this button puts it into Command reserve so it takes it off the map and can be redeployed As you can see we now have a three here and the unit here is occupied so it's, it's used up the move by the US and you can see this in the log as well. They sent a fighter command to Shenyang to achieve air superiority and they essentially kicked, made our, our unit kick the bucket. And I'm gonna take that loss because I'm not mm, all that interested, you know? I, I can, let's do some scouting here. We can do reconnaissance and we can see down here there's a submarine and a ground unit and a fighter unit over here. Oh. That failed, that also failed, there you go. Over here is nothing, and then over here we can't find out yet. Oh, maybe let's try one more time. There you go. We have a carrier over here, one fighter and one ground unit. So the carriers can use their fleet, their, their possibilities to achieve air superiority as well. So we don't really want to have units in uh, war zones, because they have one, two, three, at least three fighters 
in this entire area in the East Asia and East, East Asian theater. So attacking without having any fighters ourselves here would be futile. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to secure North Korea. And let's see what the opponent does here, what the US do. Yes, as to be expected, they took the chance of the moment and they destroyed our ground unit with their uh, with their, one of their one of their air commands. So that is very unfortunate, but we do hold Shenyang at the moment, and it is very unlikely that US troops will come through here because they would have to abandon South Korea, you know, they would have to have a ship, then they load in the ground unit, bring them over here, take that over, and that would be threatening to us, of course, but at the moment, not really a big threat, simply because what's going on absolutely nothing is going on uh it, it would leave south korea unarmed we could just march in some that they're not going to do that i have trust that chen yang is safe from a strategic tactical point of view right so let's go into something that is scenario specific in this region we have access to three asian oh god <laughs> uh three chinese generals they're of course chinese lin zhu lin bao uh Jude and Peng De Huai. But at the moment we can only use Peng because he's the only one that is available for this scenario as you can see. So let's play Peng. The arrival of Peng Duhai. De, De Huai. General Peng De Huai. I swear to god, I can't pronounce any of this and I'm so sorry that, that I can't. <laughs> Takes command of local Chinese People's Liberation Army Force in Inner Mongolia. East Asia policy updated. Comrade General Secretary, my force is the poorest and most poorly armed. Just like the people, we have everything to gain. My duty is to hold ourselves responsible for, uh, to the people. Every word, every act, and every policy must conform to the people's interests, and if mistakes occur, they must be corrected. So, Peng Duhai, Dehuai, just arrived over here in Mongolia. I'm just gonna, in Inner Mongolia, I'm just gonna keep calling it Peng, because that's the name that I can actually pronounce. And uh, as you can see, nothing much happened yet, but he is active, and him being active will trigger some events. What exactly kind of events we will see in the future what i will do for the moment i will go back to the world map here and as you can see by the way this region is lighted up to show you there is an event in uh, event in the waiting here i can always get it up it's the same event that we've already looked at it's the local tribes that want independence but i want Mars Tung to rise and then i will pick this option down here uh, so as long as i don't pick it it reminds me by just being lighted up right we're going to go to our main theater, as you can see, a lot more military might standing around here in our Soviet territory and in the vassal states that we have created over here. And I'm going to take this fighter, I'm going to put it into command reserve. Are you certain you would like to retire the fighter command in Yakutia to your command reserve? Absolutely. I'm going to take another one, which will be this one. And then I will take a bomber. There you go. I don't, you know, in a, in a real campaign, you probably don't want to do that. But I'm going to do it because I know I don't have to focus on any of this. Bit exploitative if you think about it, but let's be real here. That's just how scenarios work. And what we, what else we're going to do is in state affairs over here. Because starting in 1946, so at the very start of the campaign, you can start researching nuclear tech. And if you start researching it early in a timeline, then you will generate more nuclear power and arsenal that you would see here once it's generated. Uh, over the entire timeline. Nuclear arsenal, whenever your turn starts, gain progress corresponding to your production value. Research. Implement all effects instantly. Grants nuclear strike ready armed forces a nuclear icon marking and updating unit capabilities. Bomber command. So this is what they could do once we have one nuclear arsenal, one nuke. Gains nuclear strike capabilities. Strikes can be intercepted by enemy fighters from fighter commands or carrier fleets and require a complete air superiority in the target region to succeed. We have enabled our nuclear arsenal production. Exactly, Mervyn. So as you can see, we have now 0.1 uh, in 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 arsenal production right now. It will rise by turn by turn, and eventually we will get an advantage there. What I will do right now is I will position another tank over here in North Korea to secure the north of the peninsula entirely. <laughs> Right, I hope this isn't too much to take in. I, I know I'm very quick about talking. It's just that this is so much content. It's, it's such a huge scenario. I'm amazed by what they've put out here. Anyway, the March of New China from General Peng Dehuai, People's Liberation Army HQ. I request your instructions to reorganize Chinese forces. The ropes cut deep into my young back as a 10-year-old laborer in the fields, the barefoot bitter grin of a child with a hungry belly. 
Wherever we go, we will unite with the people, take root and blossom to weed out poverty. So now we have a choice here. We can increase centralization, which gives us plus two influence in Inner Mongolia and will instantly flip Inner Mongolia to us. We could do keep the current structures, which just gives us one FP, so one focus point. It would prolong the turns that we have in this timeline. Or we could do increase decentralization, which would take away one influence from Inner Mongolia, but give us three that we can freely position anywhere in mainland China. I'm going to take uh, increase decentralization because it's my favorite one. It gives us a quick access here to Beijing, and that is exactly what we need, I think. So what we're going to do, and this, by the way, will end our turn. I could have closed the event up here had I have to do anything else, but this is one of those turn ending things. It's like positioning a troop. And now that I've already picked this, if I click here, I just lose three position influence, uh, three influence that I could have positioned, and my turn still ends. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position two here so that this region is now under our control. Mind you, it is still a war zone. That is very important to notice. If I were to move a ground troop over here, they could completely decimate me with their fighters. Uh, and then I want to put one here into Inner Mongolia simply because I want to reclaim Inner Mongolia as soon as possible so that we have a nice little uh, barricade up here. Right, and this ends the turn as you can see. In the main game, just to let you know, you will have three generals active and it will be a bit more of a struggle. This is like the easy mode, I can already tell you. The Call of Liberation. I've notified Chinese General Shu De. He is in the game, we just don't have any interaction with him directly. Of my intentions to start a large scale guerrilla offensive. What we lack in firepower, we will make up in planning, cunning, and strategy. I will lead from the front lines. If I fall, contact him. So we can either approve of this or be against it. So we have dispatched journalists to cover your fight for liberation, which gives him more power, and him having more power uh, will have an influence that we will see in a second here. It would raise his power to seven. It would give us one focus point and plus one people. We're, we're good on the people front. I think if we give, if we get one people, it's not too bad. Uh, you know, you always want to balance this. Sometimes you have events that cost you stuff. Like for example, down here, we have secretly dispatched military supplies. We also get an FP, but we lose one military. That would throw us into a crisis, into crisis mode, because the military would be so weak that our state essentially can't keep our puppets and everything else together. And that is threatening. That is something you never ever want. Plus one government would be huge. But as I said, minus one military, not really a choice. I think this is, these are the options that you take when you took the uh, military focus instead of the elite focus. We could also just do this, plus one elites, minus one military, but I'm gonna choose the journalists that are gonna spread the word of get General Peng Dehuai, you know, spreading revolution all over China. So he gains power, we gain one FP and one people. There you go. And now we are in our normal mode here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this submarine. So, this submarine is in a zone that is not declared a war zone. If I moved it down here, there was a unit there. I theoretically could cause creating a war zone I, that would drive up the doomsday clock. And once it's here, it might be the end of the world. Not in this scenario, but in free play. So you always, you don't want to create too many war zones. Your proxy wars should be rather contained. However, subs have a power to them. Hunter killer duty, passive. When combat ready, which it is right now, detects enemy sea fleets in adjacent non-Arctic regions. Now that's interesting, in the Arctic you could move along and, uh, you know, you could have ships and the submarines wouldn't detect them. But in this case, it is combat ready and as you can see, I can't see anything down here. I can't pass over there because the strait is under allied control with a five control as well. I think they reinforced that, yeah. They reinforced it twice, plus one influence in northeastern Japan. So I'm going to move it in here. War zone declaration. With the exception of non-combative sea navigation, this action constitutes a danger and a provocation. Could force a response for state security. In view of given order, information is needed to confirm imminent, imminent action into USA-controlled region. Do you want to proceed? If I didn't know that there was an empty area there, I would create a war zone. But watch this. Area is empty, no war zone created. My submarine is now in this area and this submarine definitely spots us. But we didn't create a war, we didn't create anything, you know, so we're good to go. Revolutionary Guardian, General Peng De Hawaii, People's Liberation Army HQ. We've captured two Soviet grain merchants in a village exploiting the peasants and seized their storehouse. What is to be their fate? 
Modesty and simplicity is our motto, we shall defeat elitism and opulence wherever it may be as not to create false idols. I now have a choice between handing them over to us, uh, to our men for trial in the USSR, have them trialed according to proletarian justice, or reprimand Peng in favor of Lin Biao for diverting. Um, so, you know, this is difficult decision. We could take away power from, from Peng and give one to Lin. Now, Lin is not in the scenario, so not too important. But that would give us two influence in Shenyang. Now, that is amazing, isn't it? No, it's not. Because we want to focus, as I said earlier, on Inner Mongolia. Having power there is a major, major motivation for me. So we're going to get these traders, these merchants, in the USSR. We'll probably want to hang them or something over there. You know, justice and all that. And uh, we're going to gain one influence in Inner Mongolia. One FP, so we gain one focus point so that we have can hang out for one turn longer in this scenario or in this timeline rather and we gain one government very good as you can see we're now two only one away from uh, winning it all and our turn is still running now i don't want to you know i it's interesting to see this carrier we knew of it beforehand because we scouted it but now we could actually kill it submarines kill carriers carriers kill surface fleets surface fleets kill submarines and with that we could get rid of one fighter wing at least in this area but I don't think it's worth it. We would cause a war zone. We would uh, increase the military's power. And I think we're good keeping it down there. You know, you don't you don't have to push it up too high. What we're going to do instead is a false flag. First of all, let's do some reconnaissance. There you go. So it failed once. And then we know, oh, down here is another carrier. No carrier down here because we can see into it. This entire sea zone is empty. But then we're going to do a false flag. Chance to carry out operations falsely implicating the USA. Granting plus one influence. It will also end the turn. That's nice of them to tell us, isn't it? So we failed once. And we succeeded. As you can see, three regions in mainland China now under our control. Also, although they are still war zones. And we did it all without the military. That is one way to play the scenario. I just want to mention it. That is a single way. You could just march in... Uh, you know, threaten South Korea, directly bomb all of them, and, and try that. I'm going to try to do this in a bit more non-escalation and nuclear warfare kind of way. We should send fresh envoys to Chinese regions that are not currently taking sides against imperialist uh, US interests. What message should they bring? So I can only pick one out of these. Oh, I we will take a look at that later. I can pick only one out of these. Now let's take a look. Peng's Chinese power at least 10. If he had 10, it would cost us nothing. His power would increase, we would gain plus 1 FP, and influence in Tibet would rise. Then you have a threat that they will be given no mercy. Lin active, not Peng active in China. So only if uh, Peng was not active in China, would we actually be able to do this. So this is completely impossible in this scenario. In free play, however, it would definitely be there. We could also give them a promise of economic abundance. Peng's power plus 1. Plus one FP, minus one finance, and plus one influence in Tibet. The thing is, we don't have that much finance. However, uh, right now we're fine. You know, we're gonna give them some expensive gifts, make essentially a campaign for a Tibet. Uh, you know, you're not the richest place. What about we build you up in terms of uh, brotherhood? You know, human brotherhood, uh, where all socialists and communists have to stand together. And we're gonna do that, gain influence in Tibet, and then we're gonna take a look at this event this is an event that i definitely want to show off because it's important to understand how peng works general peng de Huai can only be promoted if his power is greater than 15 by the end of the timeline my little brother died of hunger i will not rest until all people in china have a meal to eat in hardship we see true friendship if we make no selection we've seen this before with the urumqi tribe then at the end of the timeline Ma, uh, Ma will promote Peng and that will bring us 10 victory points and victory points at the end of the day is what decides whether or not we win against the enemy in a free play, right? If we don't want to do that, we could use Peng to limit Ma's power that would subtract power from Ma Zedong, you know, if, if we... Uh, I don't know, Ma might later kind of flip away from us, you know, the Sino-Soviet break. Uh, we could denounce Peng to Ma, so that would strengthen Ma Zedong. He's not in play yet, but he would have plus four power we would lose elites plus one uh, focus point and peng's power would also be set to zero that either of these are the death of peng now that is something we do not want so we will just not activate it as you can see we now have two events the calamitous request and this one that are just hanging in the background you know not doing anything in particular and that we can activate at will right 
Now that we've done that, we come to an interesting part. Let me just do a bit, little bit of espionage. This espionage button, it shows you down there always. It gives you how many elites the US have and how much uh, focus points they have. We have seven, so five plus two. And what their nuclear arsenal looks like. Let's, let's scout them. So of course that loses us one elite. They have seven elites, four focus, uh, four focus points. So we have three more, which means that if we don't gain any other focus points in this entire scenario, we would have three more rounds, that we, three more turns that we can play out in this timeline before we both usher into the next timeline and they are back with exactly as many focus points as we have them. However, more interesting to us is, you know, getting more and more focus points so that we can kind of outpace them in this scenario and in this theater. So for starters, what we're going to do is I'm going to activate this policy, Red Dragon Rising, declare peace and control Chinese regions. I will declare peace in all of the regions that we currently hold. And now I can freely position troops in all three of them and not fear that they will bomb us unless they want war. And that would cause so much doomsday uh that well that would cause the doomsday clock to tick up and essentially i'm i'm building up on the us not wanting that they can still spy on us they can find out if i'm positioning troops there which i will be but it is unlikely at least i hope so that they will actually take those troops out because it's not worth it taking out some troops you know uh just to declare war get the doomsday clock ticking and maybe cause the end of the world I want to position a troop here, and I will, I, I will show you why in a few turns. We get plus one military for deploying the troop here, as is tradition, you know, that it strengthens the military, of course. And in the meantime, uh, the US, let me just quickly put that away, the US have uh, reinforced their control over South Korea. They're now at five influence, that's the maximum influence that you can have. Let me just see, by the way, if we... Oh, they have a two new guards, and they are further ahead than we are. I'm just looking for the blue ones. I'm seeing... So far, they've also concentrated on everything in... In East Asia. They have not done anything in... For example, here in Iran, you know? That is something that I have seen the AI do. They, they do very different things, because, of course, we are focused on everything... Uh... On everything East Asia because it is important to us to win that and and secure the entire region however of course the world is larger and you know the US for example might be focused on establishing full control on everything over here in in Europe they might be focused on getting some client states in Iran to threaten us from the south that kind of stuff right so I think it's it's kind of nice that so far they focus on East Asia we're direct competitors and what I'm gonna do I'm going to play another tank here in Beijing. We're going to stack Beijing with tanks. Oh no, I didn't do the... I didn't do the event. I can do it still. I can do it still, I think. Okay, they're doing that turn. One influence in Guam. Kuomintang... Oh no, the event just went away. Fuck. Okay, so Kuomintang defectors. General Peng de Hawaii. A high-ranking enemy defector invites us to liberate a US-controlled region. One who stands straight doesn't fear a crooked shadow. We could either go very good, we could go, we will interrogate him instead, which gives us plus five influence in uh, East Asia and one influence directly in Gangshu, sending him back as an intelligent asset, preventing all friendly defectors. I'm gonna be a meanie and I'm gonna interrogate him. Tell me more. So they've lost one influence in Gangshu and we have gained general percentage down here. Um, let me see if no. Okay, we lost the we lost one event. I skipped it sadly. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to do that. It it's just to my it's it's just my issue as well. I'm losing out there. Not not anybody else. I'm gonna position one more in Beijing. And after that, one more. I can already spoil it. There's no surprise there, because what I'm doing here is I'm strengthening Mao so that when he spawns, he will be extraordinarily strong. Because he will essentially appropriate those armies and use them to establish his strength all over China. So that, I, you know, he's protected against assassinations. So that he's protected uh, against everything else. And so that he can spread communism all throughout China. Anyway, sensing a major attack, I retreated. That is the event that I skipped, didn't, isn't it? So, there you go. 
and avoid a decisive confrontation with a strong enemy unit sent to defeat us. I plan to pursue the US by Kuomintang, repeatedly ambush and defeat them by a thousand pricks of the needle. So if we make no selection, we uh, uh, would get plus one finance, or we do approved, he gains plus two and plus one uh, focus point for us, or dispatch units to help out locally. He only gains one power, but we gain plus two influence in Lanshu, and that is what we're gonna do. Lanshu is now at one, still not flipped entirely, not under our control properly, but pretty good so far, don't you think? And as you can see, the dragon rises as a policy to pacify regions will be possible in four turns, so not that far away. And now we have four units in Beijing. That is, to me, enough. If we spawn, if we uh, uh, let Mao be created right there. Ooh, something happened. South Korea, they attacked us, but we contained them because we have uh, multiple units stationed in, South Korea, in North Korea. Okay, here comes something important, agrarian reform, and you will see why in a second. Countrywide agrarian reforms can be done with the right advisors. We request your, uh, you replace the current reform aides. They just arrived recently, sent by the USSR Ministry of Finance, but it has become clear that the men sent, sent are once again not suited for the task. This is because Mao had his own reformist plans. You may have heard of him, they didn't go so well. And we could either insist on Soviet-style reforms, which would take away an, uh, an ability of Mao, or we could uh, reprimand the Ministry of Finance, which would cost us money, obviously. Cost us government as well, but bring us influence in Shenyang. Or we could reprimand Peng in favor of Lin Biao. And we're going to reprimand Peng because he shouldn't be, you know, in these situations. I'm not going to take back my, fi uh, my advisors. I'm not going to intervene against Mao. I'm just going to say, Peng, shut up. This is none of your business. You're a general. Get out of here. And we gain finance, Peng's power is reduced, but not by much, so we'll be fine. He'll be- f he'll survive, alright everybody? And now here comes the fun part. Uh, in East Asia, we have state affairs with a rich history and multitude of cultures and religions. It's the cradle of dynastic empires. With the establishment of Western influence, there has been an unraveling of the fabric of their societies, sparking ideological and civil wars. A battleground between nationalistic, communistic and Western ideals. We have Kim Il-sung, we haven't spawned in, and we have Ma Tse-tung, we also haven't spawned in, and I think... So hear me out here. The way I play, we're not even gonna spawn in Kim Il-sung. I think he and Mao are a better combination if you do a military playthrough of this scenario, because there's a lot of approaches here that are viable. But what I'm doing is a peaceful one, and Mao Tse-tung is perfect for that. So let's focus on Mao. He's a staunch anti-imperialist that resents ideas that deviate from his own communist views. In his world, there's no limit to the cost worth paying for the inevitability of a communist China. Provides military liaisons for selection in order to coordinate Sino-Soviet action. He has four abilities. The first one is spend one power to gain plus one influence. The second one is <clears throat> spend one power per unit to restore combat status of, ad uh, of adjacent friendly units. The third one is Great Pillar of Asian Communism. Spend one power to position plus one influence in any region on mainland China. That's huge. And then the fourth one, also huge, Maoist Land Reformer. Had we chosen what, what you know, in that event, uh, had we chosen the first possibility, then he would have lost this ability. But this one is important because it... <coughs> pardon me. Because it has us gain one finance in exchange for one power. That is good. He starts with six power. We will recruit him right now. He appropriates four of our units. And now he has 10 power. Now isn't that beautiful? For starters, absolutely, it is beautiful. But secondly, now that he has taken power, we can recognize the communist Chinese claims, which minus one government, but it gives Ma Tung two power. That is pretty big, and we don't have to lose influence or leads to do it. So let's do that. He gained two power, now he's at 12. Uh, they're not too happy with us, but you know, they're not unhappy either, so that's fine. And I will just do some more reconnaissance. So they have one used up basic tank here, uh, one unused fighter. The tank will be available in attacking, I think, in like one or two rounds either, not sure. Uh, they still have the fighter down here. What about the... Okay, we can't... Okay, I I'm gonna stop trying. All of this was just rejected. I just kept losing elite points here. I wonder if the... Carrier is still down there. I'm not sure if it is. 
So I still have the submarine here in a war path. You definitely want to go down over here, take down this carrier, then potentially take down this carrier. Uh, you want to position the fighters that I, you know, got from our Soviet area over here. You want to position them in Mongolia or in Shenyang, and you want to get rid of these fighters, get rid of these fighters here in uh, North Japan. And I think then you can go into full advance. And I honestly think you might even be able to take over Japan itself. Not sure. I uh, just my just my thoughts, right? Right. So far, so good. What we're gonna do is just to be sure. I'm gonna position an additional tank over here. Just to make sure that they cannot take North Korea from us. Another communist tactical victory achieved. That is very, very good. But this one is a bit different, isn't it? Okay, the USSR provide help to restore sanitary conditions in Jinan. The historical city is crammed with refugees and plagued by disease and epidemics. We have dispatched engineers and a hospital train. Plus one uh, focus points. Position three influence. Are you crazy? That is so good. We can only provide as much, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or we bypass the old citadel. Peng's Chinese power less than three. Yeah, no, he's powerful enough to take care of this. I'm going to dispatch some of our engineers and hospital trains over there. Uh, it weakens our military influence because we are obviously stretching our resources and, you know, investing in other regions of the world. But now we can invest three points anywhere in China. And I'm going to flip this region immediately. And then I'm going to invest in Tibet to get to two. So only one more necessary to flip it. Oh, and this is beautiful. You don't even know it yet. I'm, I'm going to work on this in a second. So right now, I, I could bet on it, okay? Right now, I think the US ran out of focus points. Let's take a look. Lose one elites, of course. Zero focus points. This means that we have four focus points remaining. If I end a turn, one of my focus points goes away and I will immediately get to the other turn. The US doesn't get any turns in this timeline anymore because they didn't save them up. They didn't produce them like we did. So we are outpacing them. Our military engagement, you know, they are overstretched. They don't have the resources in China. They, they have uh, Chiang Kai-shek as a general, like we have Peng. But uh, apparently they are not really good at it, are they? So we are outpacing them and we can now thresh into China at least for four more turns. But as you can see here already, we are generating more uh, FP by this event, for example, so we can now thresh through China. And my idea is, this is what I hope to achieve, that the US never get a turn, that I can end this scenario before the timeline ends and the US would get would get turns again. So we could approve this and Peng's power would rise by plus two, or it would only rise by plus one. Uh, and we would gain power in Lanzhou. Now Lanzhou, I believe, is already under our control. So I'm just going to give him the power. Yeah, Lanzhou is already under. We could have pushed it to five, but eh, not really, not really in my interest. There's not too much that, you know, it, it wouldn't be too meaningful. Let's just say it like that. And then we will do a false flag over here in Tibet. We know we're going to bomb, a, I don't know, we're going to bomb a, a Buddhist temple and we're going to scream America, America. Or something like that anyway and that will make the buddhists think wow we really hate americans and then they will become communists it doesn't that sound all right ah we failed once ah we failed twice okay we did it the last one did it so now we have more control over there another tactical victory sensing a major attack i have retreated okay we've already basically seen this one but now it's a bit different because it happened in nanjing uh so it, it's it's somewhere else, right? It's He is a general that commands troops all throughout China, but now he is in Nanjing. And uh, I will definitely dispatch units to help out locally so that his power rises by one. We get one focus point again. This, this is a free move, essentially. And then plus two influence in Nanjing. So we are now at zero here in Nanjing. And I will now use Mao. That is what, what I have him for, right? I will use him. To get us influence on Taiwan, because I want Taiwan. There's no escape for, for the Kuomintang. They can't flee to Taiwan and claim their false China. They will rest here in mainland China, and Taiwan will turn to us before they even lose the war. A helping hand. Another USSR guarantee of solidarity is needed to stabilize prices as they have risen 100-fold or more. With my forces approaching Chengdu, the rumor of battle caused another serious monetary fluctuation. Oof, so we have three 
We have three money. <laughs> we have three financial power. We can approve it and lose three, but we would get three free influence positions. Jesus, that's so good. Uh, we could limit it, which would give us one. Or we reprimand Peng and we kind of leave the people hanging, you know? Like, Peng cares for the people and he's like, Man, if you don't do this, then the people won't really have anything to eat. So maybe you want to help us out? Uh, or we could reprimand him, as I said, and he would lose power. Lin, who we can't control, but he is here, would lose, uh, would win power. And we could position two influence. Mm. Now, I think... I, you know, I care a lot for starving people, but they will never ever starve again if we win this war. So I'm sorry, man. We can't make any resources free. Instead, we're just gonna use our resources to push in a... in a... To push in an... Military, in a military sense. So I'm gonna get rid of power here in Jinan, and now it's again our turn because the US are run have run out of terms, uh, turns. Oh, and same thing going on in Chengdu, huh? Well, I mean, no, I already told you once. Don't have to tell you twice, do I? Right, as you can see, more power distributed over here. So instead of helping us, <laughs> he keeps wanting. To, you know what? All right, buddy, I'm gonna help you on a limited way, and take Jinan over while we're at. Oh. Oh, I accidentally put it into... I accidentally put it into Beijing. Curses. I wanted to put it into Jinan, obviously. But, so he, you know, requires us to do it. Because he's a man of the people. And he kept asking for it. Anyway, uh... General... We should send fresh envoys to... Chinese regions that are not currently taking sides against imperialist US interests. Right. We are very limited. Uh... He's not strong enough. He's not as 10. What, what is he at? I don't know where his power... Oh, his power is at 9. So if we do this once, the next time we could choose the communist ideals here, which is free. He just has to have that amount of power. So let's let's pick this one. And uh, Nanjing just gained 1. Perfect. And what I'm going to do now is a bit military. Uh, but, you know, it's not too bad. I'm going to send my troops over here so that we can take over Urumqi completely. They are a very friendly bunch over there, but they are also kind of... I, I mean, I don't know, man. Just submit. You might be a tribe, but Mao isn't that bad, alright? He'll civilize you. So, it's the same event again, and this time we actually physically cannot do what he demands of us because we don't have the money. So I will just reprimand him. I, I have to, I'm sorry. Right. So far, so good. <laughs> we have to do it again. <laughs> we just don't have the money. I'm so sorry. Actually, I might. You know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create some money. Oh, no, 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 okay. So this was a mismanagement warning, and I'm just gonna get take care of that by doing some reconnaissance. If it fails, it costs us, and I know this is a bit gamey, maybe something to look uh, into for the future, but now I have limited it, and we are no longer in a crisis. The elites, otherwise, were to topple the nation, you know, they were to become too detached and topple the targets of communism, and that is definitely not what we want. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to reprimand him again, I'm sorry, I have to do it. I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to take a room key, and then we can use our military, hopefully. He has achieved another tactical victory. Uh, victory. Uh, let's see. No, I'm, I'm just going to approve this, because he's going to gain power, and that is okay. What I'm going to do is, this turn though, I'm going to have you create some, some wealth with your policies. And we've seen this in the past already. I'm just gonna let you become more powerful and then I'm gonna use you actually to gain presence in Taiwan. And I'm gonna do it one more time. Right, and in this case, as you can see, now it's free to do this. We gain one FP and because he's powerful enough, he becomes even more powerful. He, in he inspires other people as a general to join the communist revolution. So we're gonna pick this. I'm gonna choose Mao once more. I'm gonna influence Taiwan so that we are on plus one and then I will keep expanding right now we could help him out here we could position one but he's already so powerful I might as well reprimand him right but let's reprimand him and let's take over this one there you go now we've taken over Nanjing and we've achieved another tactical victory uh, we don't need any influence in Nanjing but I mean there's no now nah, let's let's have Peng become more powerful because if you were in a proper scenario to promote Ping, P 
ping needs to ping needs to be at 15. He's currently at 14, so we're not even ready to end this timeline. Not that we are going to end it. My plan is actually working. We are outpacing the US so much that I will be able to take over all of China and win the scenario outright. I want to take this by force, and our Urumqi is ours. And I will support you. Yeah, I do actually have the money, so let's do it. I will support you, and we're going to invest over here in Guangzhou. Yes, more influence in Guangzhou. There you go. Uh, what I will do is, I will, first of all, trigger the dragon so that all of this is now a peaceful area. The enemy in the next timeline, if we were to play that long, would have to risk quite a lot to actually move in over here. So, good choice. Good choice to pacify the entire region. Now, only Chengdu, Guangzhou and Taiwan are still in enemy's hands. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna stage a false flag over here. Failed once, failed twice, failed thrice. There you go. Four, fourth time is the charm. And now that we have taken this, and this is interesting, now that we've taken the coast, the uh, Kuomintang are fleeing over to Taiwan. And this is why, because I already knew it. I'm sorry, I wanted to show off Taiwan, okay? Uh, this is why I influenced Taiwan. You either win the, the sea battle, this is the military way, and then have a surface fleet, fleet over here to achieve in this event, uh, to succeed in this event, or you influence them. We should attack the US-supported Kuomintang's last stronghold in Taiwan and reunify the island into the Chinese state. They are weak and vulnerable. As you can see, attack would uh, require a surface fleet in Taiwan. So for the US, it's vital to win the sea war or you will get kicked out of Taiwan and China. So that is very devastating. Or you'll just say Taiwan is ours, plus three influence in Taiwan, minus one military, plus one power to Mao Zedong. And just like that, we have taken over Taiwan and with that, practically, have almost entirely taken over China. Only Chengdu remains in the Civil War. I will... So, something that I've also not showed up. And we're already 46 minutes in. Holy shit, dude. This is what I'm saying. This is a big, big hammer, alright? This is a huge scenario. And maybe I'm going to replay it militarily in the future to show you the different playstyle. Uh, but I just wanted to cram in, essentially, how do leaders work? How does the management work? How does taking over regions work? How do you win without actually fighting? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you. And if I move him into an allied territory, then he can move twice in one turn. And I've done just that. So I'm going to move him into Chengdu. So that he may take over Chengdu. Uh, yes, rallying cry as always. And then we will just... Slowly but surely take over good old Chengdu. Mm -hmm. If we make Peng lose power, he goes down to 15, and 15 is enough that he would survive this timeline, which is the ultimate goal because it gives us fifth. Uh, no, it gives us 10 victory points. So let's just reprimand him again, and then I will actually influence regions that we have already taken. Because why not, right? Just. Uh, strengthening our grip over the region and the the goal don't forget that the goal in this entire thing is uh 50 presence 50 percent presence we're at 46 i'm gonna just approve in this case and then i'm gonna attack again oh shit and if i lose this scenario yeah i'm gonna be sad and mad but i'm not so elites you lose it after i think like three turns of you being uh, uh maxed out on something and in this case, what I'm gonna do is just I'm gonna do some reconnaissance. You know, whenever it doesn't work, that's in my favor right now because I want to get rid of some elite points. And oftentimes, you know, only in this scenario you can abuse it like this. In the in the free free play, it's gonna be way different because you need your elite points to do decisions worldwide. So I can just do it here because it's it's a scenario. And sometimes you gotta do things. You know, that's just the way it is. Right. And this man now is very powerful. If I reprimand him once more uh, I get two position that I can then position over here and that should almost bring us to 50% next turn I promise oh shit I've never seen this one before uh, Soviet style agrarian reforms agrarian reforms are underway in Shenyang Beijing Jinan Nanjing Guangzhou and Chengdu with hard work we will achieve a complete socialization of Chinese agriculture at the end of the timeline so we could either say good 
We could prioritize regional ideological planning in stat or statistical planning. So that gains us elites and influence in Jinan. Or we do finance and influence in Shenyang. But why wouldn't you just go with uh, Peng's power at the end of the timeline? Lose some money. Uh, I mean, we couldn't, can't really afford the money, can we? I guess this is military. If we, if you do the military way, you will be lacking elites. And in this case, that is good. But we're just going to focus on gaining money and Chen Yang influence. And it, this might actually end the scenario. I just want to say that it might outright end the scenario. I think it will because 45 out of 90 is 50%. So what I'm going to do instead, I think... Ugh, you know what? I mean, I want to control all of this. I'm going to take this. There you go. We've won. All of China, including the Taiwan. Of a winning streak. I hope so. Friendship of a lifetime. I hope so, Mervin. Now the stats are wrong because this isn't the proper game. I have wins and losses zero and zero because this isn't the proper free play game. But what it comes down to is I won the Chinese Civil War simply by using the Chinese army. I didn't send in any of my own troops. I only safeguarded North Korea. I used General Peng to focus on what is important, which were the military advances. He didn't like it very much most of the time. But, uh... You know, like, he is a person, he must feel rather hollow after the campaign that I led him through. Because, uh, he never was allowed to help the poor people. He always asked me, and I was like, nah, I'll focus on just marching on. But he was so famous that people still flocked to his banners, so... He must feel rather unhappy with how I treated him. However, the USSR has won the battle of ideologies. You have survived. And that is how you win the big picture. Uh, scenario 7 for terminal conflict peacefully and it's not properly peacefully because it's still a war zone and our proxies which are the Chinese our proxies army won but we didn't directly intervene except that one time when we went into Urumqi and then down here in Chengdu as well we ended up holding all of it there's another path and I might put up a video for that if I uh, feel confident enough it's a very difficult scenario I can tell you that much but there's another path where you essentially win the war you get naval supremacy you march in with troops etc etc and you can win the chinese civil war just by the virtue of you pushing with troops so i might do that i just wanted to show off how mao's used i didn't use kim il sung in this one at all because you know we didn't really need him and uh, that left him fairly powerless which i'm okay with he's not a nice dude regardless this was a heavy hitter sorry for as much of a content bump as this one and i will see you in the next episode of terminal conflict 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 back on this channel thanks for watching and until then